Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Well, thanks for joining us today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team. I'm Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and I'm here today with my dairy colleague, Gail Carpenter, who is an ISU Assistant Dairy Teaching and Research Professor, as we discuss today's topic. So welcome to the podcast, Gail. Good to be here, Jen. Well, it's getting cold out, and it's hard to believe because just, what, two or three days ago, we had extreme temperatures of like 60, 70 degrees, and now we're back down to 30, 40 degrees. Yeah, I was wearing a t-shirt on Wednesday. Yeah, there was, I saw some kids out in shorts and t-shirts and um, just thankful everybody's okay and our animals were safe. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a quite of an interesting experience um, having that on December 15th. (laughs) Yep. But now it's cold. Now we got, now we got cold weather to deal with. Yeah, now I think we're definitely into the cold season, and I've been getting quite a few calls lately on just different calf strategies, calf care strategies, thinking about how do I feed my calves, or what do I do to, you know, make sure that they're getting some calories in during this cold weather season. So just wanted to take some time today to discuss with you, Gail, on your thoughts, and, you know, we can kind of walk through some strategies that we've seen have worked for people, and uh, maybe somebody will find these useful as they get into their cold weather season. Mm -hmm. But we do know that, you know, when we get closer to these lower temperatures, especially those newborn calves, you know, right now they are, you know, well below their thermal neutral zone. They like temperatures between 50 and closer to that 80 degrees. And so anything below 50 degrees, those calves start, you know, expending calories, expending energy where they should be using it for growth. And so we have to find ways, new ways to make sure that they're keeping up on their energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't have that room in yet to, to ferment and give them some extra heat there. So we got to help them out a little bit. Yeah. And when they get kind of past that, you know, three month or three weeks of age or one month of age, they can tolerate a little bit more colder temperatures closer to that 32 degrees, but Mm -hmm. still, even at that temperature, you know, there are some strategies we need to think about. So Um, I guess a good rule of thumb I like to think about is anytime that temperature gets close to zero, then we need to think about increasing energy levels almost 50% to get them back up to where they at least are gaining some weight and can stay healthy. Mm -hmm. So as we move into some of those strategies, um, obviously, you know, that first day of life care is going to be what you normally do on your farm, right? So looking at um, colostrum care, how you typically handle that and making sure we're getting the appropriate amount of immunoglobulins into them. So somewhere in that 200 to 300 IgGs of colostrum in those first two feedings uh, is still appropriate, uh, but we have to think about their environment, right? So if they're out in a maternity pen, it could be cold. So how do we get them into a different warming area? You have strategies for that, Gail? So we actually have our own warming, warming stall at the Iowa State Dairy. Um, so we'll have a stall that's ready and set up with a heat lamp on it. Um, we cover the, cover the top of the stall there in our calf barn, um, get the calf dry as soon as we can, um, and get her under that heat lamp so that we can, we can set her off on the right foot. So Um, yeah, we come prepared and depending different people's facilities are obviously going to look different on how they handle that, but just being prepared with something to warm a calf up and and making sure that you're monitoring that pre fresh or close up pen, um, and catching calves as soon as possible. I mean, that's important all year. Same thing with colostrum, right? Like it's hard to overemphasize how important colostrum is, but especially when we're talking about that extra cold stress on calves, it's just even more important. Yeah, you brought up a good point of, you know, those warming boxes and actually have a producer that I know that um, their maternity pen is kind of a ways away from where their calves are housed. So they actually built a kind of a portable warming box. So they put them in into this warming box and and hook it up to their ATV or UTV 
and then they can transport those calves. So, you know, even if it's cold out, those calves are still protected from wind and kind of some of those extreme temperatures. And then they just back up that warming box into a, uh, a different warming barn. And, oh. you know, it's just a, just thinking about transportation and how they get those calves to and from different buildings. Yeah, kind of neat. that's a neat idea. Yeah, if I wouldn't be wanting to run around outside wet, I don't think a calf would be either. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, definitely. So when we think about those temperatures, cold temperatures, I think that means more groceries into the calf, right? So how do we get more calories, more energy into those calves? And sometimes that can be hard because if you have a facility where you know you are outside feeding calves and hutches, do you want to be feeding more than two times a day because that that increases your labor right but right. Um, actually adding that third feeding can provide a lot of benefits to that calf yeah well you said it earlier right like we need them to be spending those uh, those calories on growth we really know how important that pre weaning growth is to the calf's lifetime health lifetime production um, and we don't want to skip on skimp on that in the winter time. So getting those extra groceries, those extra calories to the calf to really help her be set for success is, is super critical. And, and that could be, you know, like you said, it could be feeding more times a day. It could be feeding uh, higher solids, higher fat, um, just feeding more milk. There's, there's a bunch of different ways that we can kind of promote some of that caloric intake to calves. I think no matter how you do it though, getting them that extra buffer to help them, you know, those extra calories so they can spend those calories staying warm and growing and not having to choose between one or the other. Yeah. And I think, you know, some people wonder, well, the temperature is 60 degrees today. Maybe I should back off on the feeding, but I think once these temperatures start staying consistently mm -hmm. low, just pick your winter feeding program and can and stay consistent with it because calves need consistency. Right. So if you're going to feed three times a day, or you're going to add an extra quart to their feeding mm -hmm. during those two two feedings, then just stick with that through the you know the remaining of the of the winter season because mm -hmm. um, anytime you kind of fluctuate their diet, that just causes a lot of upsets. Right. Yeah. And it's not going to hurt around those sixty degree days to have an extra quart either. So right. Kind of erring on the side of being consistent and, and giving her more is probably what's going to work best for most, most calves and most farms. Yeah. And actually I find, um, I have some producers that they liked the performance of their calves on that three times a day feeding that they actually stuck with it through the remaining of the year. And now they just kind of, um, put that into their feeding program and, uh, having really good luck with it. So yeah, you may yeah. find you like it. So <laughs> You can make it work three months out of the year or six months or however long winter is in Iowa. You can make it work all year. That's right. And then another question I get is why well, feed pasteurized milk uh, for two feedings, but I don't have enough pasteurized milk to, you know, to get to that third feeding. So how do you make that work? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, milk replacer. Um, but making sure it's warm, right? So we pasteurize milk, you warm milk and I think making sure that you're not giving cold uh, or below temperature liquid to the calves. Milk replacer is a great way to kind of make up some of that extra. Of course, we have to make sure that we're monitoring solids mm -hmm. uh, again, because if you have too many solids, again, that's going to cause some digestive upsets. So just trying to, you know, monitor where you're at with milk replacer and your, and your whole milk is important. Right. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to not have cold stress calves but have nutritional scours instead. <laughs> you don't yeah. want to trade one problem for the other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then uh, same goes with like your incorporation of adding fat too because fat is good, but we also don't want to suppress their ability to maybe intake calf starter too. So mm -hmm. kind of monitoring that level, uh, making sure we're not feeding too much so that you know, eventually we want them to be eating calf starter and that's going to really help drive that, that heat generation and rumen fermentation. So, you know, just kind of monitoring that and, and making sure the quality of the fat is, is good because there are, you know, some that can cause worse digestive upsets than others. So just, you know, making sure we have a good source of fat. Yeah. I think regardless of the strategy that you're looking at, it's really important to make sure that your nutritionist and your veterinarian are involved with those conversations. Yep, definitely. 
All right, so we covered colostrum, getting more groceries in them, keeping the milk warm and consistent. What else should we be thinking about? Well, I think you really hit an important point there with saying that we need to be promoting that starter intake. Um, and again, I'll, I've, I've said it already, I'll probably say it a couple more times, but that's kind of one of those back to basics things that just stays super important as, uh, as the weather gets cold, because that's going to be something that also promotes some of that lifetime health and productivity is that is the caloric intake from starter there. But yeah, you're really promoting a lot of that room and development. Um, and, and, you know, getting that calf to the point where she is going to provide her own heat of fermentation at some point. So, so you don't want to, you don't want to delay that starter intake at all. Another thing that I think we often tend to overlook, and it it's a little trickier in the winter, um, but uh, water is really important for rumen development as well. Um, and so if we can get calves, it, it's going to freeze outside, um, but making sure that we're getting them warm water throughout the day um, and that they have access to that is, is something else that's going to help promote that rumen development there. That's definitely important. I remember feeding calves and breaking out the ice chunks of mm. the buckets and having to refill them. And, but, uh, at the time I didn't think it was very much fun, but then now, you know, realizing the value of yeah. you know, the importance of water, it, it, it's a tedious job, but we somehow we have to figure out how to get right. water into those calves. You always have those little circles of ice behind the hutches there when you've been knocking the buckets out onto the ground and yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. building a little igloo and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you so, have tips for producers to making sure that those that those calves have a source of warm water? Well, I think, you know, especially during the winter time, calves are going to go up and drink their milk, right? And mm -hmm. they're already standing. So, you know, offer that water right around the same time that you're feeding milk mm -hmm. because they're still standing. About the time that they start laying down, they're probably not going to get up very much more throughout the day until their next feeding. So, you know, offer it within a half hour of that, that milk feeding and, and everything that you're doing in your normal routine. And then maybe you just have to go back through and dump out those water buckets um, until the next feeding. So, yeah. you know, they're not gonna drink a whole lot of water, but, you know, just like us, we need water too. So yeah. however much water you can get into them. Yeah, well, and that probably offering it at the same time you're offering milk that that helps with some of the labor issues with that too, since you already have somebody out there who's watching those calves anyway and, and feeding those calves anyway, um, kind of combining those tasks together is gonna make it a little bit more labor efficient. And Gail, I see you have a couple extra layers on today too. So it is cold <laughs> outside and so calves need an extra layer too. What do you do for calf jackets? Yeah, I've, I've transitioned from my summer bibs to my winter bibs. Uh, so yeah, the, I mean, Kind of, if I'm going to put a jacket on, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little less cold sensitive than a calf would be, but we've, we've had our outdoor calves in particular, they've had their, their blankets on um, for a few weeks now. Uh, and, and yeah, it is especially important with those hutch calves. And we have to remember the wind chill as well, right? Not just the ambient temperature, but what is that wind adding? So when we had that big storm earlier this week, the winds were coming out of the south, right? Flowing right through our calf doors. So making sure that we're considering what effect that wind chill is going to have on those calves as well. You know, if you if you'd tell your kids to put a coat on when they went outside, probably should probably should have that for your calves too. Yeah, it's and it's fun to see those calves and calf jackets. And by the time they're two months old, they're kind of busting out of them mm -hmm. and <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> so yeah, definitely important in that environment. And then just making sure that the actual bedding source that they're laying on is dry too. Cause you talked about that wind chill and, you know, if they're laying on any type of wet material, uh, that's just going to be a source of trying for those calves to try to stay warm. They're going to expend more en energy that way. So, you know, lay down in the, in the calf pen with them and yep. are your knees wet or is your butt wet when you get up off the, off the ground? If so, then that probably means we need to think about what kind of drainage or, you know, adding more straw yeah. to their, to their environment. Well, adding that extra straw, that's going to have a couple benefits there too, right? Because it's not, it's going to be dry. So it's going to prevent some of that wetness, but it's also going to allow the calves to nest a little bit more too, and, and kind of burrow in and, and make a little bit of a, a barrier there. So making sure that calves have dry bedding, but also enough bedding so that they can, they can burrow up and nest is important. 
I think it's important to kind of watch the straw length as well when you're looking at nesting scores. Uh, so straw with a longer particle length, they tend to be able to nest a little bit better than the shorter uh, particle length straw. So brown bale straw tends to work pretty well um, when you're looking at bedding for calves in the winter in particular, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a good point. Didn't think about that of the actual length of the straw. Mm -hmm. Save the short chop, short chop straw for your dry cows. Good plan. Yeah, and then of course, if you add, if you're adding more straw, there could be the potential for more ammonia buildup, particularly mm -hmm. if you're in a calf barn. Um, so just taking note of what the air quality is in the barn. You know, if they're in individual pens within a barn, sometimes you start to create this little micro environment, and then all of a sudden, the air quality isn't very good. So you know, even in wintertime, we need some source of ventilation in those barns. And I know positive pressure tubes are a good source uh, for some farms that works really well just to introduce some sort of fresh air into the barn and get some of that stale air mm -hmm. out of the barn. We're not trying to, you know, get a draft on those calves, but, you know, they still need some sort of fresh air within the barn. Yeah, there's a lot smaller margin for air during the cold months when it comes to air quality. Uh, and when it comes to keeping our calves warm, but also, like you said, making sure that they have that fresh air and making sure um, that there's not an ammonia smell. Um, and and yeah, just like with your knee test, right? Get down on their level, see what see what the calves are breathing. If you don't like breathing it, they're just little babies. They don't like breathing it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we covered a lot of good points and, you know, they're all practical things that we can implement and, have in our winter program or winter protocols for calves. And most of the research that I've found, um, actually Cornell University summarized some calf data over a 10 year period and found that just one pound daily gain difference resulted in 850 pounds more milk in that calf's first lactation. And so if you think about winter time, that's a really hard time to get those calves to gain a pound, right? So adding these extra things in is going to really help, you know, maintain their, their weight gain so that you see the benefits of milk production two years down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We talk about a, a lot about that when we talk about rearing calves, you know, it's one of the most expensive times in a, in an animal's life, right? The feed's more expensive. It's a lot more labor intensive, um, than other points in a, in a heifer or cow's life, but really the payout is, is substantial. So making sure that we are making those investments in the long-term health and productivity of, of those calves all year during heat stress and during cold stress, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to overstate the benefits of that. Great. Well, Gail, I have a tip sheet that I'm going to include in the show notes here today on our podcast. Um, it's called don't leave your calves out in the cold this winter strategies for cold weather calf care. So if anybody wants to download that, you can print it, stick it on your wall in your, in your barn, or uh, give it to somebody that's going to be managing calves through the winter. Uh, just provide some little tips that will help you get through this cold weather season. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for being on the podcast, Gail, and it was a great topic, great discussion, and uh, we look forward to visiting with our audience again on the next Dairy News and Views from ISU. Yeah. Stay warm, everybody. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.